Ow. Hello and welcome to this second look exploring session and today we are looking at Gobadoc or uh, the tragedy of Ferrix and Porrex, uh, depending on your point of view. Merry Christmas, everybody! Yes, this is a play for Christmas Revels, uh, designed uh, for Christmas, and therefore it's really depressing. Um, this is also a play which is full of visual uh, treats. Uh, there are dumb shows in the original text um, which are really interesting and really exciting and we're not doing them today. And I'm really sorry about that. It's slightly willfully perverse today. We are primarily focusing on doing a straight through read of just the text. We've done quite a few workshops. We've done a first look at this play. We're going to be doing a lot more on this play because um, it's, it fascinates me. And, uh, and so the visual element we will come back to promise um but uh, reading through the play and its various parts we have this crack team of readers um and reading the one of the title characters depending on which title you want to go with reading gorbaduck today is hello i'm sarah blake i'm an actor writer and director living in germany and i've got my gorbaduck crown on uh, reading uh, one of the other potential title characters uh, ferrex and also fergus later on is Hello, I'm Pamela. I'm an actor based in London. And uh, reading Porex today is... Hello, I'm Emma Kemp. I'm an actor and I'm also based in London. Uh, reading a, one of the councillors, Eubulus, today is... Alicia Chapel, uh, actor, translator and theatre maker based in the north of England. Reading another one of the, those councillors, Arostus, is... Hello, I'm Lynn. I am a college writing teacher. I live in the Northwestern United States. And uh, reading oh, the last of the uh, original set of counselors, Philanda is. Hi, my name's Elizabeth Lemisu, and I'm an author based in London. And uh, filling out the extended family of Gorbadoc, his wife, Fidena, is played by. Hi, Lindsay Beecham here. I'm an actor, and I currently live in Norfolk. And uh, reading uh, one of the witnesses to this tragedy, Marcella is. Hello, I'm Helen Good. I'm a historian and I'm in Hull. And uh, reading one of the messengers as well as Mandud is. Hello, I'm Dan. I'm an actor based in Montpellier, France. Mandud being one of the later dukes who arrives. Uh, also reading uh, Tindar and Clotin is. Liza Graham. Uh, Custodian of Cats in London. Uh, Not the musical, the animal. <laughs> and uh, reading Hermon today is... Hi, I'm Eric. I was going to do this originally as Gollum, but the mic does not like the S sound a lot. And also, it does, he doesn't do long speeches. No. Um, not, not that there are many long speeches in this play at all. Uh, reading Dordan and another messenger annuncius later on is... I'm Steve Longstaff, uh, based in uh, Lancaster in the northwest of the UK. And uh, reading the chorus, chorus who, uh, for uh, our purposes, is as close to the dumb show as we will get, is... I am Alan Scott, neither an actor nor an academic, and I've got to attempt to be quadrophonic, because I'm four ancient and sage men of Britain. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, the, we wait for the multiplicities of Alan's. Uh, and I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I'll be reading later on uh, Gwenard, uh, one, another one of the Dukes uh, of Cumberland, uh, as, as it happens. Um, so though this is the cast and this is the play. And we're going to say do a straight run through. We haven't done any rehearsal. We've done a, some workshops. We've done some notes. But otherwise, we're just going to see what happens. So all I, remains is to ask all those not in the first scene to clear the stage and enjoy the tragedy of Ferex and Porex or Gorbadoc. The silent night that brings the quiet pause from painful travails of the weary day prolongs my careful thoughts and makes me blame the slow aurora that so for love or shame doth long delay to show her blushing face. And now the day renews my griefful plaint. 
My gracious lady and my mother, dear, pardon my grief for your so grieved mind to ask what cause tormenteth so your heart. So great a wrong and so unjust despite without all cause against all course of kind. Such causeless wrong and so unjust despite may have redress or at the least revenge. Neither, my son, such is the froward will, the person such, such my mishap and thine. Mine know I none, but grief for your distress. Yes, mine for thine, my son. A father? No, in kind a father, but not in kindliness. My father? Why, I know nothing at all, wherein I have misdone unto his grace. Therefore the more unkind to thee and me. For knowing well, my son, the tender love that I have ever borne and bear to thee, he grieved thereat, is not content alone to spoil thee of my sight, my chiefest joy, but thee of thy birthright and heritage, causeless, unkindly, and in wrongful wise, against all law and right, he will be reeve. Half of his kingdom he will give away. To whom? Even to Porrex, his younger son, whose growing pride I do so sore suspect, that being raised to equal rule with thee, Methinks I see his envious heart to swell, filled with disdain and with ambitious pride, the end the gods do know, whose altars I full oft have made in vain of cattle slain to send the sacred smoke to heaven's throne for thee, my son, if things do so succeed, as now my jealous mind misdeemeth sore. Madam, Leave care and careful plaint for me. Just hath my father been to every wight. His first injustice he will not extend to me, I trust, that give no cause thereof. My brother's pride shall hurt himself, not me. So grant the gods. But yet thy father so hath firmly fixed his unmoved mind that plaints and prayers can no whit avail. For those I have essayed, but even this day he will endeavour to procure assent of all his counsel to his fond device. Their ancestors from race to race have borne true faith to my forefathers and their seed. I trust they equal bear the like to me. <laughs> there resteth all. But if they fail thereof, and if the end bring forth an ill success, on them and theirs the mischief shall befall, and so I pray the gods requited them. And so they will, for so is wont to be when lords and trusted rulers under kings to please the present fancy of the prince with wrong transpose the course of governess. Murders, mischief, or civil sword at length, or mutual treason, or a just revenge, when right succeeding line returns again, by Jove's just judgment and deserved wrath, brings them to cruel and reproachful death, and roots their names and kindreds from the earth. Mother, content you. You shall see the end. <sighs> the end? The end, thy end, I fear. Jove, end me first. My lords, whose grave advice and faithful aid have long upheld my honour and my realm and brought me to this age from tender years, guiding so great a state with great renown. Now more importeth me than erst to use your faith and wisdom, whereby yet I reign, that when by death my life and rule shall cease, the kingdom yet may with unbroken course have certain prince, by whose undoubted right your wealth and peace may stand in quiet stay. And eke they that whom nature hath prepared in time to take my place in princely seat, while in their father's time their pliant youth yields to the frame of skilful governance, 
may so be taught and trained in noble arts as to what their fathers, which have reigned before, have with great fame derived down to them. With honour they may leave unto their seed, and not be thought for their unworthy life, and for their lawless swerving out of kind, worthy to lose what law and kind them gave, but that they may preserve the common peace, the cause that first began and still maintains the lineal course of king's inheritance, for me, for mine, for you, and for the state, whereof both I and you have charge and care. Thus do I mean to use your wonted faith to me and mine, and to your native land. My lords, be plain, without all wry respect or poisonous craft, to speak in pleasing wise, lest, as the blame of ill-succeeding things shall light on you, so light the harms also. Your good acceptance, O my most noble king, of such our faithfulness as heretofore we have employed in duties to your grace and to this realm, whose worthy head you are, well proves that neither you mistrust at all, nor we shall need in boasting wise to show our truth to you, nor yet our wakeful care for you, for yours, and for our native land. Wherefore, O king, I speak as one for all, sith all as one do bear you equal faith, doubt not to use our counsel and our aids, whose honors, goods, and lives are whole avowed to serve, to aid, and to defend your grace. My lords, I thank you all. This is the case. You know the gods, who have the sovereign care for kings, for kingdoms, and for common weals, gave me two sons, in my more lusty age, who now, in my decaying years, are grown well, towards riper state of mind and strength, to take in hand some greater princely charge. As yet they live and spend their hopeful days with me and with their mother, here in court. Their age now asketh other place and trade, and mine also doth ask another change. There's to more travail, mine to greater ease. When fatal death shall end my mortal life, my purpose is to leave unto them twain the realm, divided into two sundry parts. The one, Ferex, my elder son shall have, the other shall the other Porex rule. That both my purpose may more firmly stand, and eke they that may better rule their charge, I mean forthwith to place them in the same, that in my life they may both learn to rule, and I may joy to see their ruling well. This is, in sum, what I would have you weigh. First, whether you allow my whole device, and think it good for me, for them, for you, and for our country, mother of us all, and if ye like it, and allow it well, then for their guiding and their governance, show forth some means of circumstance as ye think meet to be both known and kept. Lo, this is all. Now, tell me your advice. And this is much, and asketh great advice. But for my part, my sovereign lord and king, this do I think. Your majesty doth know how under your justice and in peace, great wealth and honor long we have enjoyed, so as we cannot seem with greedy minds to wish for change of prince and governance. But if we like your purpose and device, our liking must be deemed to proceed of rightful reason and of heedful care, not for ourselves, but for our common state, sith our own state doth need no better change. I think in all, as erst your grace has said, first, when you shall unload your aged mind of heavy care and troubles manifold, and lay the same upon my lords, your sons, whose growing years may bear the burden long, as long I pray the gods grant it so, and in your life, while you shall so behold, their rule, their virtues, and their noble deeds, such as their kind behights to us all, great be the profits that shall grow thereof. Your age and quiet shall the longer last. Your lasting age shall be their longer stay. For cares of kings that rule as you have ruled for public weal and not for private joy do waste man's life and hasten crooked age with furrowed face and with enfeebled limbs to draw on creeping death a swifter pace. They too, yet young, shall bear the parted reign with greater ease than one now old alone can wield the whole for whom much harder is with lessened strength and du the double weight to bear. Your eye, your counsel, and the grave regard of father, yea, of such a father's name, 
Now at beginning of their sundered reign, when it is hazard of their whole success, shall bridle so their force of youthful heats, and so restrain the rage of insolence, which most assails the young and noble minds, and so shall guide and train in tempered stay their yet green bending wits with reverent awe. As now inured with virtues at the first, custom, O king, shall bring delightfulness. By use of virtue, vice shall grow in hate. But if you so dispose it that the day which ends your life shall first begin their reign, great is the peril. Your great is the peril that will be the end when such beginning of such liberties void of such days as in your life do lie, shall leave them free to random of their will and open prey to traitorous flattery, the greatest pestilence of noble youth. Which peril shall be passed if in your life their tempered youth with aged father's awe be brought in your of skillful stayedness. And in your life, their lives disposed so shall lengthen your noble life in joyfulness. Thus I think it that your grace hath wisely thought and that your tender care of common weal hath bred this thought, so to divide your land and plant your sons to bear the present rule while you let yet live, to see their ruling well, that you may longer live by joy therein. What further means be hopeful are and meet, at greater leisure may your grace devise when all have said, and when we be agreed, if this be best, to part the realm in twain and place your sons in present government, whereof, as I have plainly said my mind, so what I hear the rest of all my lords. In part, I think as hath been said before, in part again, my mind is otherwise, as for dividing of this realm in twain and lotting out the same in equal parts. To either of my lords, your grace's sons, that think our best for this your realm's behoof, for profit and advancement of your sons, and for your comfort and your honour eke. But so to place them while your life do last, to yield to them your royal governance, to be above them only in the name of the Father, not in kingly state also. I think not good for you, for them, nor us. This kingdom since the bloody civil field, where Morgan slain did yield his conquered part, unto his cousin's sword in Cumberland, containeth all that women did suffice, three noble sons of your forefather Brute. So your two sons, it may also suffice, the more the stronger, if they agree in one. The smaller compass that the realm doth hold, the easier is the sway thereof to weld, the nearer justice to the wronged poor, the smaller charge and yet enough for one, and when the region is divided so, the brethren be the lords of either part, such strength doth nature knit between them both, in sundry bodies but by conjoined love, that not as two, but one of doubled force, each is to other as a sure defence. The nobleness and glory of the one doth sharp the courage of the other's mind, with virtuous envy to contend for praise. And such an equalness hath nature made between the brethren of one father's seed, as an unkind wrong it seems to be, to throw the other subject under feet of him, whose peer he is by course of kind, and nature that did make this equalness, oft so repineth at so great a wrong, that oft she raiseth by a grudging grief, in younger brethren at the elder state, whereby both towns and kingdoms have been raised, and famous stocks of royal blood destroyed, the brother that should be the brother's aid, and have a wakeful care for his defence, gapes for his death, and blames the lingering years, that brings not forth his end with faster course, and oft impatient of so long delays. With hateful slaughter he presents the fates, and heaps a just reward for brother's blood. With endless vengeance on his stock for I, such mischiefs here are wisely met with all, if equal state may nourish equal love. Where none has cause to grudge the other's good, but now the head to stoop beneath them both, 
May kind, may reason, may good order bears, and oft it hath been seen that where nature hath been perverted in disordered wise, when fathers cease to know that they should rule, and children cease to know they should obey, and often over kindly tenderness is mother of unkindly stubbornness. I speak not this in envy or reproach, as if I grudge the glory of your sons, whose honour I beseech the gods to increase. Nor yet as if I thought there did remain so filthy cankers in their noble breasts, whom I esteem, which is their greatest praise, undoubted children of so good a king. Only I meant to show my certain rules, which kind hath grasped within the mind of man, that nature hath her order and her course, which, being broken, doth corrupt the state of mind and things, even in the best of all. My lords, your sons may learn to rule of you. Your own example in your noble court is fittest guide of their youthful years. If you desire to seek some present joy by sight of their well ruling in your life, see them obey, so shall you see them rule. Whoso obeyeth not with humbleness will rule with outrage and insolence. Long may they rule. I do beseech the gods, but long may they learn ere be they begin to rule. If kind and fate would suffer, I would wish them aged princes and immortal kings. Wherefore, most noble king, I were well sent between your sons that you divide your realm. And as in kind, so much them in degree. But while the gods prolong your royal life, prolong your reign, for there to live you here. And therefore have the gods so long forborne to join you to themselves, that still you might be a prince and father of our common weal. They, when they see your children right to rule, will make them room, and will remove you hence, that yours in right and theory of your life may rightly honour your mortal name. Your wanted true regard of faithful hearts makes me, O oh king, the bolder to presume to speak what I conceive within my breast, although the same do not agree at all with that which other here my lords have said, nor which yourself have seemed best to like. Pardon, I crave, and that my words be deemed to flow from hardy zeal unto your grace and to the safety of your common weal. To part your realm unto my lords, your sons, I think not good for you, nor yet for them, but worst of all, for this, our native land, for with one land, one single rule is best. Divided reigns do make divided hearts, but peace preserves the country and the prince. Such is in man the greedy mind to reign, so great is his desire to climb aloft in worldly stage the stateliest parts to bear that faith and justice and all kindly love do yield unto desire of sovereignty where equal state doth raise an equal hope to win the fame that either would attain your grace remembereth how in past years the mighty brute first prince of all this land possessed the same, and ruled it well in one. He, thinking that the compass did suffice for his three sons, three kingdoms eke to make, cut it in three, as you would now in twain. That how much British blood hath since been spilt to join again the sundered unity. What princes slain before their timely hour? What waste of towns and people in the land? What treasons heaped on murders and spoils whose just revenge even yet is scarcely ceased. Ruthful remembrance is yet had in mind that gods forbid the like to chance again and you, O king, give not the cause thereof. My lord Ferex, your elder son, perhaps whom kind and custom 
gives our rightful hope to be your heir and to succeed your reign, shall think that he doth suffer greater wrong than he perchance will bear if power serve. Poor X, the younger, so upraised in state, perhaps in courage will be raised also. If flattery then, which fails not to assail the tender minds of yet unskillful youth, in one shall kindle and increase disdain and envy in the other's heart in flame. This fire shall waste their love, their lives, their land, and ruthful ruin shall destroy them both. I wish not this, O king, to befall, but fear the thing that I do most abhor. Give no beginning to so dreadful end. Keep them in order and obedience, and let them both by now obey you learn such behavior as beseems their state. The elder mildness in his governance, the younger a uh, yielding contentedness, and keep them near unto your presence still that they, restrained by awe of you, may live in compass of well-tempered stay and pass the perils of their youthful years. Your aged life draws on to feebler time, wherein you shall less be able to bear the travails that in youth you have sustained, both in your persons and your realm's defense. If planting now your sons in further parts, you send them further from your present reach, lest shall you know how they themselves demean. Traitorous corruptors of their pliant youth shall have unspied a much more free access. And if ambition and inflamed disdain shall arm the one, the other, or them both to civil war, or to usurping pride, late shall you rule that you nay wrecked before. Good is, I grant, of all to hope the best, but not to live still dreadless of the worst. So trust the one that the other be foreseen. Arm not unskillfulness with princely power, but you that long have wisely ruled the reins of royalty within your noble realm, so hold them while the gods, for our avail shall stretch the thread of your prolonged days. Too soon he climbed into the flaming car whose want of skill did set the earth on fire. Time. An example of your noble grace shall teach your sons both to obey and rule. When time hath taught them, time shall make them place. The place that now is full. And so I pray long it remain to comfort of us all. I take your faithful hearts in thankful part but, Seth, I see no cause to draw my mind, to fear the nature of my loving sons. Don't to misdeem that envy or disdain can their work hate where nature planted love. In one self purpose do I still abide. My love extendeth equally to both. My land sufficeth for them both also. Humber shall part the marches of their realms, the southern part the elder shall possess, the northern shall Porex, the younger rule. In quiet I will pass mine aged days, free from the travail and the painful cares that hasten age upon the worthiest kings. But, lest the fraud that ye do seem to fear of flattering tongues corrupt their tender youth, and ride them to the ways of youthful lust, to climbing pride, or to revenging hate, or to neglecting of their careful charge, lewdly to live in wanton recklessness, or to oppressing of the rightful cause, or not to wreak the wrongs done to the poor, to tread down truth, or favour false deceit. I mean to join either of my sons, some one of those whose long approved faith and wisdom tried may well assure my heart, 
that mining fraud shall no way find to creep into their fenced ears with grave advice. This is the end. And so I pray you all to bear my sons the love and loyalty that I have found within your faithful breasts. Breasts. You nor your sons, our sovereign lords, shall want our faith and service while our hearts do last. When settled stay doth hold the royal throne in steadfast place by known and doubtless right, and chiefly when descent on one alone makes single and unparted reign to light, each change of course unjoints the whole estate and yields it thrall to ruin by debate. The strength that knit by fast accord in one against all foreign power of mighty foes could of itself defend itself alone. Disjoined once, the former force doth lose. The sticks that sundered break so soon in twain, in faggot bound attempted were in vain. Oft tender mind that leads the partial eye of erring parents in their children's love, destroys the wrongly loved child thereby. This doth the proud son of Apollo prove, who rashly set in chariot of his sire, inflamed the parched earth with heaven's fire. And this great king that doth divide his land and change the course of his descending crown and yields the rain into his children's hand from blissful state of joy and great renown. A mirror shall become to princes all to learn to shun the cause of such a fall. I marvel much what reason led the king, my father, thus without all my desert to reave me half the kingdom, which by course of law and nature should remain to me. If you with stubborn and untamed pride had stood against him in rebelling wise, or if with grudging mind you had envied so slow the sliding of his aged years, or sought before your time to haste the course of fatal death upon his royal head, or stained your neck with murder of your kin, or some face of reason might have might perhaps have seemed to yield some likely cause to spoil you thus. The reekful gods pour on my cursed head eternal plagues and never dying woes. The hellish prince adjudge my damned ghost to Tantal's thirst or proud Ixion's wheel, or cruel gripe to gnaw my growing heart, to during torments and unquenched flames, if ever I concern so foul a thought, to wish his end of life or yet of reign. <laughs> yet your father, O most noble prince, did ever think so foul a thing of you. For he, with more than father's tender love, whilst yet the weights, fates do lend him life to rule, who long might live to see your ruling well, to you, my lord, and to his other son, lo, he resigns his realm and royalty, which never would so wise a prince have done if he had once misdeemed that in your heart there ever lodged so unkind a thought. But tender love, my lord, and settled trust of your good nature and your noble mind made him to place you thus in royal throne and now to give you half his realm to guide. Yea, and that half which, in abounding store of things that serve to make a wealthy realm in its stately cities and in fruitful soil, in temperate breathing of the milder heaven, in things of needful use, which friendly sea transports by traffic from the foreign parts of flowing wealth in honour and in force, doth pass the double value of part that Porex hath allotted to his reign. Such is your case, such is your father's love. Ah, love, my friends. Love wrongs not whom he loves. <laughs> Nay, yet wrongeth you, that giveth you so large a reign, ere that in the course of time bring you to kingdom by descended right, which time perhaps might end your time before. 
is this no wrong, say you, to read from me my native right of half so great a realm, and thus to match his younger son with me in equal power and in as great a degree? Yea, and what son? The son whose swelling pride would never yield one point of reverence, when I, the elder and apparent heir, stood in the likelihood to possess the whole. Yea, and that son which from his childish age envieth my honour and doth hate my life, what will he now do when his pride his rage, the mindful malice of his grudging heart, is armed with force, with wealth and kingly state. Was this not wrong? Yea, ill-advised wrong to give so mad a man so sharp a sword. To so great peril of so great mishap, wide open thus to set so large a way. Alas, my lord, what griefful thing is this, that of your brother you can think so ill? I never saw him but a likely sign whereby a man might see or once misdeem such hate of you, his such unyielding pride. Ill is their counsel, shameful be their end, that raising such mistrustful fear in you, sowing the seed of such unkindly hate, travail by reason to destroy you both. Wise is your brother, and of noble hope, worthy to wield a large and mighty realm. So much a stronger friend have you thereby, whose strength is your strength, if you agree in one. If nature and the gods had pitched so their flowing bounty and their noble gifts of princely qualities from you, my lord, and poured them all at once in wasteful wise upon your father's youngest son alone, then perhaps there be that in your prejudice would say that birth should yield to worthiness. But sith each good gift and princely acts ye are his match, and in the chief of all, in mildness and in sober governance, ye far surmount. <laughs> and sith there is in you sufficing skill and hopeful towardness to wield the whole and match your elders' praise, I see no cause why ye should lose the half. Nay, but, nay, would I wish you yield to such a loss, lest your mild sufferance of so great a wrong be deemed cowardice and simple dread, which shall give courage to the fiery head of your young brother to invade the whole, whiles yet therefore sticks in the people's mind the loathed wrong of your disheritance, and ere your brother have by settled power, by guileful cloak of an alluring show, got him some force and favor in this realm. And while the noble queen, your mother, lives to work and practice all for your avail, attempt redress by arms and wreak yourselves upon his life that gaineth by your loss, who now to shame of you and grief of us in your own kingdom triumphs over you. Show now your courage, meet for kingly state, that they which have avowed to spend their goods, their lands, their lives, their honors in your cause may be the bolder to maintain your part. When they do see the coward fear in you shall not betray, nay, fail their faithful hearts, if once the death parex end the strife and pay the price of his usurped reign, your mother shall persuade the angry king the lords your friends eke shall appeal his rage, for they be wise, and well can they foresee that ere long time your aged father's death will bring a time when you shall well requite their friendly favor or their hateful spite, yea, or even their slackness to advance your cause. Wise men do not hang so hang on passing state of present princes, chiefly in their age but they will further cast their reaching eye to you and weigh the times and reigns to come. Nay, is it likely, though the king be wroth, that he yet will, or that the realm will bear extreme re revenge on his only son? Or if he would, what one is he that dare be ministered to such an enterprise? And here you be now placed in your own, amid your friends, your vassals, and your strength, we shall defend and keep your person safe till either counsel turn his tender mind 
or age or sorrow and his weary days. But if the fear of gods and secret grudge of nature's law, repining at the fact, withhold your courage from so great an attempt, hold ye, know ye that lust of kingdoms hath no law. The gods do bear, and well allowing kings, the things they ab abhor in rascal routs. When kings on slender quarrels run to wars, and then in cruel and unkindly wise command thefts, rapes, murder of innocents, to spoil of towns and reigns of mighty realms, think you such princes to suppose themselves subject to laws of kind and fear of gods? Murders and violent thefts in private men are heinous crimes and full of foul reproach. Yet none offense, but decked with glorious name of noble conquests in the hands of kings. But if you like not yet so hot device, nay, list to take such advantage of the time, but though with great peril of your state, you will not be the first that shall invade. Assemble yet your force for your defense and for your safety stand upon your ground. Oh heaven, was there ever heard or known so wicked counsel to a noble prince? Let me, my lord, disclose unto your grace this heinous tale, what mischief it contains. Your father's death, your brother's, and your own, your present murder and eternal shame. Hear me, O king, and Suffer not to sink so high a treason in your princely breast. The mighty gods forbid that ever I should once conceive such mischief in my heart. Although my brother has bereft my realm and bear perhaps to me an hateful mind, shall I revenge it with his death, therefore? Or shall I so destroy my father's life that gave me life? Oh, the gods forbid, I say. Cease you to speak so any more to me. Nay, you, my friend, with answer once repeat so foul a tale. In silence, let it die. What lord or subject shall have hope at all that under me they safely shall enjoy their goods, their honours, lands and liberties, with whom neither one only brother dear, nay, father dearer, could enjoy their lives? But, sith I fear my younger brother's rage, and sith perhaps some other man may give some like advice to move his grudging head at mine estate, which counsel may perchance take greater force with him than this with me? I will in secret so prepare myself, as if his malice of his lust to reign break forth with arms or sudden violence, I may withstand his rage and keep mine own. I fear the fatal time now draweth on when civil hate shall end the noble line of famous brute and of his royal seed. Great Jove defend the mischiefs now at hand. Oh, that the secretary's wide advice had erst been heard when he besought the king not to divide his land, nor send his sons to father parts from presence of his court, not yet to yield to them his governance. Lo, such are they now in the royal throne, as was rash Phaeton in Phoebus' car. <laughs> then the fiery steeds to draw the flame with wilder random cut through them kindled skies, then traitorous counsel now will whirl about the youthful heads of these unskillful kings. I hear of their father will inform them. The reverence of him perhaps shall stay the growing mischiefs while yet they are green. If this help not, then woe unto themselves. The prince, the people, 
the divided land. And is it thus? He so prepare against his brother as his mortal foe. And now, while yet his aged father lives, neither regards he him nor fears he me, war would he have, and he shall have it so. I saw myself the great prepared store of horse, of armour, and of weapons there. To bring I to my lord reported tales without the ground of seen and searched truth. Lo, secret quarrels run about his court. To bring the name of you, my lord, in hate, each man almost can now debate the cause and ask a reason of so great a wrong. Why he, so noble and so wise a prince, is as unworthy reft his heritage. And why the king, misled by crafty means, divided thus his land from course of right. The wiser sort hold down their griefful heads. Each man withdraws from talk and company of those that have been known to favor you, to hide the mischief of their meaning there. Rumors are spread of your, your preparing here. The rascal numbers of the unskillful sorts are filled with monstrous tales of you and yours. In secret was I counseled by my friends to haste me thence, and brought you, as you know, letters from those that both can truly tell, and would not write unless they knew it well. My lord, yet ere you move on kindly war, send to your brother to demand a pause. Perhaps some traitorous tales have filled his ears with false reports against your noble grace, which once disclosed shall end the growing strife. That else not stayed with wise foresight in time shall have the both your kingdoms and your lives. Send to your father, eek, he shall appease your wicked old mind and rid you of this fear. Rid me of fear? I fear him not at all. Nay, will to him, nay to my father send. If danger were for one, think ye if safety to return again? In mischief such as Ferex now intends, the wanted courteous laws to messengers served, which in just war they use. Shall I so hazard any one of mine? Shall I betray my trusty friend to him that hath disgraced his treason unto me? Let him entreat that fears, I fear him not. Or shall I to my king the or shall I to the king my mother send? Yea, and send now while such a mother lives that loves my brother and hateth me. Shall I give leisure by my fond delays to Ferex to oppress me all unaware? I will not but I will invade his realm and seek the traitor prince within his court. Mischief for mischief is a due reward. His wretched head shall pay the worthy price of this is, and his hate to me. Shall I abide, entreat, and send, and pray, and hold my yield and throat to traitor's knife, while I, with mind and Conquering force might rid myself of foes and win a realm. Yet rather, when I have the wretch's head, than to the king will I send. The bootless case may yet appeal his wrath. If not, I will defend me as I may. No, here to the end of these two useful kings, the father's death, the ruin of their realms, do not some happy state of counsellors that light on so happy lords and times, that neither can their good advice be heard, yet must they bear the blames of ill success. But I will to the king their father haste, ere this mischief come to that rightly end, that if the mindful wrath of grateful gods, since mighty Ilians fall, not yet appeased with these poor remnants of the Trojan name, have not determinedly removed fate out of this realm to raise the British line. By good advice, by all of father's name, by force of wiser lords, this king of hate may yet be quenched ere it consume us all. When youth not bridled with a guiding stay is left to random of their own delight, 
and wields whole realms by force of sovereign sway. Great is the danger of unmastered might. Let skillless rage throw down with headlong fall their lands, their states, their lives, themselves, and all. When growing pride doth fill the swelling breast, and greedy lust doth raise the climbing mind, Oh, hardly may the peril be repressed, nay fear of angry gods, nay laws kind, nay country care can farted hearts restrain, when force hath armoured envy and disdain. When kings of foresight wills neglect the reed of best advice, and yield to pleasing tales that do their fancies noisome humour feed, nay reason nor regard of right avails. Succeeding heaps of plagues shall teach too late to learn the mischiefs of misguiding state. Foul fall the traitor false that undermines the love of brethren to destroy them both. Woe to the prince that pliant eye inclines and yields his mind to poisonous tale and floweth from flattering mouth and woe to wretched land that wastes itself with civil sword in hand. Though thus it is poison in gold to take and wholesome drink in homely cup or sake. Oh, cruel fates! O oh, mindful wrath of gods, whose vengeance neither Simois' strained streams flowing with the blood of Trojan princes slain, nor Phrygian fields made rank with corpses dead of Asian kings and lords can yet appease. A slaughter of unhappy Priam's race, nor Ilion's fall made level with the soil can yet suffice, but still continued rage pursue our lives. And from the farthest seas doth chase the issues of destroyed Troy. Oh! No man happy till his end be seen. If any flowing wealth and seeming joy in present years might make a happy white, happy was Hecuba, the wofulest wretch that ever lived to make a mirror of, and happy Priam with his noble sons, and happy I till now. Alas, I see and feel my most unhappy wretchedness. Behold, my laws. Read ye this letter here. Lo, it contains the ruin of our realm if timely speed provide not hasty help. Yet, O oh ye gods, if ever woeful king might move ye, king of kings, wreak it on me and on my sons, not on this guiltless realm. Send down your wasting flames from wrathful skies to reave me and my sons the hateful breath. Read, read, my lords, this is the matter why I call you now to have your good advice. My sovereign lord, what I am loath to write, but loath I am, see that I am forced by letters now to make you understand. My lord Ferex, your elder son, misled by traitorous fraud of, of young untempered wits, assembleth forces against your younger son. Nick and my counsel yet withdraw the heat and furious pangs of his inflamed head. Disdain, saith he, of his disinheritance arms him to wreak the great pretended wrong with civil sword upon his brother's life. If, if present help does not restrain this rage, this flame will waste your sons, your land, and you, your majesty's faithful and most humble subject, Dorden. O king, appease your grief and stay your plaint. Great is the matter and a woeful case, but timely knowledge may bring timely help. Send for them unto your presence here, the reverence of your honor, age and state, your grave advice, the awe of father's name, shall quickly knit again this broken peace. And if in either of my lords your sons be such untamed and unyielding pride as will not bend unto your noble hests, if Pharex, the elder son, can bear no peace, or Porex, not content, aspires to more than you him gave above his native right, join with the juster side, so shall you force them to agree and hold the land in stay. What means this? Uh, uh, lo, yonder comes in haste Philander from my lord, your younger son. 
The gods send joyful news. The mighty Jones preserve your majesty, a noble king. Philander, welcome, but how doth my son? The son, sir, lives and healthy, I him left. But yet, O king, this want of lustful health could not be half so griefful to your grace as these most wretched tidings that I bring. Heavens, yet more, no end of woes to me. Pindar, O king, came lately from the court of Ferrix to my lord your younger son, and made report of great prepared store of war, and says that it is wholly meant against Porrex for high disdain that he lives now a king, and equal in degree with him, that claims to succeed the whole as by due title of descending right. Porrex is now so set on flaming fire, partly with crinkled rage of cruel wrath, partly with hope to gain a realm thereby, that he in haste prepares to invade his brother's land, and with unkind war threatens the murder of your elder son. Nay could I him persuade that first he should send to his brother to demand the cause, nor yet to you to stay his hateful strife, strife, which, the, which Wherefore, since there no more I can be heard, I come myself now to inform your grace and to beseech you, as you love the life and safety of your children and your realm, now to employ your wisdom and your force to stay this mischief ere it be too late. Are they in arms? Would he not send for me? Is this the honour of a father's name? Oh. In vain we travail to assuage their minds as if their hearts, whom neither brothers love or father's law, nor kingdom's care can move, our counsels could withdraw from raging heat. Do slay them both and end the cursed line. For though perhaps fear of such mighty force as I, my lords, joined with your noble aids may yet raise, shall repent their present heat. The secret grudge and malice will remain. The fire not quenched, but kept in close restraint, fed still within, breaks forth with double flame. Their death and mine must appease the angry gods. Yield not, O king, so much to defeat despair. Your sons yet live, and long I trust they shall. If fate had taken you from this earthly life before beginning of this civil strife, perhaps your sons in their unmastered youth lose regard, loose for regard of any living right, would run along and headlong with unbridled grace to their own death and ruin of this realm. But since the gods that have the care for kings of things and times dispose, dispose the order so, that in your life this kindled flame breaks forth, while yet your life, your wisdom, and your power may stay the growing mischief and repress the fiery blaze of their enkindled heat, it seems. And so ye ought to deem thereof that loving Jove has tempered so the time of this debate to happen in more days, that ye yet living may the same appease and add it to the glory of your age. And there your sons may learn to live in peace. Beware, O king, the greatest harm of all, lest by your wealthful plates your hasten death, your larger room unto their growing rage. Preserve your life, the only hope of state, and if your highness here will miss to use wisdom or force, counsel or knightly aid, Lo, we are persons, powers, and lives are yours. Use us till death, O king. We are your own. Lo, here the peril that was erst foreseen when you, O king, did first divide your land and yield your present reign unto your sons. <gasps> but, but now, O noble prince, now is no time to wail and plain and waste your woeful life. Now is the time for present good advice. Sorrow doth dark the judgment of the wit, the heart unbroken, and, and the courage free 
from feeble faintness of bootless despair doth either rise to safety or renown by noble valor of an unvanquished mind, or yet doth perish in more happy sort. Your grace may send to either of your sons someone both wise and noble personage, which with good counsel and with weighty name of father shall present before their eyes your hest, your life, your safety, and, and their own. The present mischief of their deadly strife and in the while assemble you the force which with commencement and the speedy haste of all my lords here present can prepare. The terror of your mighty power shall stay the rage of both, or that of one at least. O king, the greatest grief that ever prince did hear, that ever woeful messenger did tell, that ever wretched land hath seen before I bring to you. Porex, your younger son, with sudden force, invaded hath the land that you to Ferex did a lot to rule, and with his own most bloody hand he hath his brother slain, and doth possess his realm. Oh, heavens. Set down the flames of your revenge. Destroy, I say, with flash of wreakful fire, the traitor's son. Damn them, the wretched sire. But let us go. But yet perhaps I may die with revenge and appease the hateful gods. The lust of kingdoms knows no sacred faith, no rule of reason, no regard of right, no kindly love, no fear of heaven's wrath, but with contempt of gods and man's despite, through bloody slaughter doth prepare the ways to fatal scepter and accused reign. The son so loathes the father's lingering days, they dreads his hand in brother's blood to stain. O oh, wretched prince, nay dost thou yet record the yet fresh murders done within the lands of thy forefathers when the cruel sword bereft Morgan his life with cousin's hands. Thus fatal plagues pursue the guilty race, whose murderous hand imbrued with guiltless blood, asks vengeance before the heaven's face, with endless mischiefs on the cursed brood, the wicked child, that this brings to woeful sire, the mournful plight to waste his very life, thus do the cruel flames of civil fire, destroy the parted reign with hateful strife, mm -hmm. and hence doth spring the well from which doth flow, the dead black streams of mourning, plaints, and woe. Why should I live and linger forth my time in longer life to double my distress? Oh me, most woeful wight, whom no mishap long ere this day could have bereaved hence, might not these hands by fortune or by fate have pierced this breast and life with iron reft? Or in this, this palace here, where I so long have spent my days, could not that happy hour once, once have happed in which these huge frames with death by fall might have oppressed me? Or should not this most hard and cruel soil, so oft where I have pressed, pressed my wretched steps, sometime had ruth of mine accursed life to rend in twain and swallow me therein? So had my bones possessed now in peace their happy grave within the closed ground, and greedy worms hath gnawn this pined heart without my feeling pain. So should not now this living breast remain the ruthful tomb wherein my heart yielded to death is graved, nor dreary thoughts with pangs of pining grief my doleful mind had not afflicted thus. 
Oh, my beloved son. Oh, my sweet child. My dear Ferex, my joy, my life's delight. Is my well beloved son, is my sweet child, my dear Ferex, my joy, my life's delight, murder it with cruel death? Oh, hateful wretch, oh, heinous traitor both to heaven and earth, thou Porrix, thou this damned deed hast wrought, thou Porrix, thou shalt dearly by the same. Traitor to kin and kind, to sire and me, to thine own flesh, and traitor to thyself. The gods on thee in hell shall wreak their wrath, and here on earth this hand shall take revenge on thee, Porrix, thou false and caitiff wretch. If after blood so eager were thy thirst and murderous mind had so possessed thee, if such hard heart of rock and stony flint lived in thy breast that nothing else could like thy cruel tyrant's thought but death and blood, Wild savage beasts might not their slaughter serve to feed thy greedy will, and in the midst of their en entrails to stain thy deadly hands with blood deserve it, and drink thereof thy fill? Or if naught else but death and blood of man might please thy lust, could none in Britain land whose heart be torn out of his loving breast with thine own hand, or work what death thou wouldst suffice to make a sacrifice to appease that deadly mind and murderous thought in thee. But he who in the self same womb was wrapped, where thou in dismal hour receivedst life, or if needs, needs thy hand must slaughter make, might thou not have reached a mortal wound and with thy sword have pierced this cursed womb that the accursed Porex brought to light and given me a just reward therefore? So Ferex, yet sweet life might have enjoyed and to his aged father comfort brought with some young son in whom they both might live. But whereunto waste I this ruthful speech to thee that hast thy brother's blood thus shed? Shall I still think that from this womb thou sprung that I thee bear or take thee for my son? No, traitor, no, I thee refuse for mine. Murderer, I thee renounce, thou art not mine. Never, O oh wretch, this womb conceived thee, nor never bode I painful throes for thee. Changeling to me thou art, and not my child, or to no wight that spark of pity knew. Ruthless, unkind, Monster of nature's work, thou never sucked the milk of woman's breast, but from thy birth cruel tiger's teats have nursed thee, nor yet of flesh and blood formed is thy heart, but of hard iron wrought, and wild and desert woods bred thee to life. But canst thou hope? to scape my just revenge, or that these hands will not be broke on thee. Dost thou not know that Ferex mother lives, that loved him more dearly than herself? And does she live and is not venged on thee? We marvel much whereto this lingering stay falls out so long. 
Horrox into our court by order of our letters is returned and Eubulus received from us behest at his arrival here to give him charge before our presence straight to make repair. And yet we have no word whereof he stays. No, where he comes and Eubulus with him. According to your highness hest to me, here have I Porex brought, even in such sort as from his wearied horse he did alight, for that your grace did will such haste therein. We like and praise this speedy will in you to work the thing that you, your charge we gave. Porex, if we so far should swerve from kind and slap those bounds which law of nature sets as thou hast done, by vile and wretched deed in cruel murder of thy brother's life, our present hand could stay no longer time but straight should bathe this blade in blood of thee as just revenge of thy detested crime. No. We should not offend the law of kind if now this sword of ours did slay thee here. For thou hast murdered him, whose heinous, heinous death even nature's force doth move us to revenge by blood again. But justice forceth us to measure death for death thy due desert. Yet, since thou art our child, and sith as yet in this hard case what word thou canst allege for thy defence, by us hath not been heard, we are content to say our will for that which justice bids us presently to work, and give thee leave to use thy speech at full, if aught thou have to lay for thine excuse. Neither, O King. I can or will deny but that this hand from breath, which fact how much my doleful heart doth wail, how oh, would it might as full appear to sight as inward grief doth pour it forth to me. So yet perhaps if ever ruthful heart melting in tears within a manly breast, If, if ever woeful man might move regret with sorrow of his fault, I think the torment of my mournful case known to your grace, as I do feel the same, would force even Ruth herself to pity me. But as the water troubled with the mud shows not the face which else the eye should see, even so your ireful mind with stirred thought cannot so perfectly discern my cause. But this unhap, amongst so many heaps, I must content me with, most wretched. That to myself I must reserve my woe, in pining thoughts of mine accursed fact, since I may not show here my smallest grief, such as it is, and as my breast endures, which I esteem the great misery of all mishaps that fortune now can send. Not that I rest in hope with plates and tears which is life for the gods I cleat for true record of this faithful speech never this heart shall have the thoughtful dread to die the death that by your grace's doom by just desert shall be pronounced to me nor never shall this tongue once to seek by suit I mean not this as though I were not touched with care of dreadful death, or, or that I held life in contempt, but that I know the mind stoops to no dread, although the fresh be frail, and for my guilt I yield the same so great, as in myself I find a fear to sue. In vain, O wretch, thou showest a woeful heart, Ferrix now lies in grave, slain by thy hand. Yet this, oh father, here, and then I end. My just knows, when my brother Ferrex and myself 
by your own hest were joined in governments of this your grace's realm of Britain land. I never saw nor travailed for the same, nor by myself, nor by no friend I wrought, but from my own most gracious goodness bent to me. But how my brother's heart even then repined with swollen disdain against mine equal rule, seeing that realm which by descent should grow holy to him, allotted half to me, even in your highness court now remains. And with my brother then in nearest place, who can record what proof thereof was showed and how my brother's envious heart appeared Yet I that judged it my part to seek his favour and good will, and loath to make your highness know the thing which should have brought grief to your grace <laughs> and your against him, soon have won a loving heart within a brother's breast, wrought in that sort for a pledge of love and faithful heart, he gave to me his hand. This made me think that he had banished quite all rancour from his thought and bear to me such hearty love as I did urge to him. But after he left your grace's court and from your highness presence lived apart, this equal rule still, still did grudge him so that now those envious sparks which erst lay raked in living cinders of dissembling breath Could he not refrain from proof of secret practice to deprive me life by poison's force? And had bereft me so, if mine own servant, hired to this fact, and moved by truth with hate to work the same, in time had not betrayed it to me. When the league and faithful promise broke, the law of kind and truth thus rent in twain, his heart on mischief set, and in his breast, black treason hid then. Then did I despair that ever time could win him friend to me. Then saw I how he smiled with slaying knife, wrapped under cloak, for deep deceit lurks and death prepared for me. Even nature moved me then to hold my life more dear to me than his, and bade this hand since. By his life, my death must needs ensue, and by his death, my life to be preserved, to share blood and seek my safety so, as wisdom willed me without protract, in speedy wise to put the same in your. Thus have I told the cause that moved me to work my brother's death, and so my life. A death, the judgment of your grace. Oh, cruel wight! Should any cause prevail to make thee stain thy hands with brother's blood? But what of thee we will resolve to do shall yet remain unknown. Thou, in the mean, shall from our royal presence banished be until our princely pleasure further shall to thee be showed. Depart therefore our sight, accursed child. <clears throat> what cruel destiny. What froward fate hath sorted us this chance? That even in those where we should comfort find, where our delight now in our aged days should rest and be, even there, our only grief and deepest sorrows to abridge our life, most pining cares and deadly thoughts do grow. Your grace should know now in these grave years of yours, have found ere this of mortal, the price of mortal joys, how short they be. How fading here in earth, how full of change, how brittle our estate, of nothing sure save only of the death, to whom both man and all the world doth owe their end at last. Neither shall nature's power in other sort against your heart prevail than as the naked hand who stroke assays the armed breast were forced thus light in vain. 
Many can yield right grave and sage advice of patient spirit to others wrapped in woe, and can in speech both rule and conquer kind, who, if by proof they might feel nature's force, would show themselves men as they are indeed, which now will needs be gods. Oh, but what doth mean the sweet cheer of her that here doth come? Oh, where is Ruth? Oh, where is pity now? Whither is gentle heart and mercy fled? Are they exiled out of our stony breasts, never to make return? Is all the world drowned in blood and sunk in cruelty? If not in women's mercy may be found, if not, alas, within the mother's breast. To her own child, to her own flesh and blood. If Ruth be vanished thence, if pity there may have no place, if there no gentle heart do live and dwell, where should we seek it then? Madam, alas! What means your woeful tale? Oh, silly woman, I, why to this hour have kind and fortune thus deferred my breath, that I should live to see this doleful day? Will every wight believe that such hard heart could rest within the cruel mother's breast? With her own hand, to slay her only son. But out, alas, these eyes beheld the same. They saw the dreary sight and are become most ruthful records of the bloody fact. Porrex, alas, is by his mother slain, and with her hand a woeful thing to tell, while slumbering on his careful bed he rests. His heart, stabbed in with knife, is bereft of life. Oh, Eubulus. Draw this sword of ours and pierce this heart with speed. Oh, hateful light! Oh, loathsome life! Oh, sweet and welcome death! Dear Eubulus, work this, we thee beseech. Ancients, your grace, perhaps he liveth yet with wound received, but not of certain death. Well, let us then repair into the place and see if Porrix live. Will thus be slain? Alas, he liveth not. It is too true that with these eyes of him, a peerless prince, son to a king, and in the flower of youth, even with a twink, a senseless stock I saw. Oh, damn it, deed. But hear this ruthful end. The noble prince, pierced with the sudden wound, out of his wretched slumber hastily start, whose strength now failing straight he overthrew, when in the fall his eyes, even new unclosed, beheld the queen, and cried to her for help. We then, alas, the ladies, which that time did there attend, seeing that heinous deed and hearing him off call the wretched name of mother and to cry to her for aid, whose direful hand gave him the mortal wound, pitying, alas, for naught else could we do his ruthful end ran to the woeful bed, despoiled straight his breast, and all we might wiped in vain with napkins next at hand, the sudden streams of blood that flushed fast out of the gaping wound. Oh, what a look, 
Oh, what a ruthful, steadfast eye methought he fixed upon my face, which to my death will never part from me, when with a braid, a deep felt sigh he gave, and therewithal, clasping his hands to heaven, he cast his sight, and straight pale death, pressing within his face, the flying ghost his mortal corpse forsook. Never did age bring so vile a fate. A heart and cruel hap that thus assigned unto so worthy a wight so wretched end. But most hard cruel heart that could consent to lend the hateful destinies that hand by which, alas, so heinous crime was wrought. O oh, queen of adamant, O oh, marble breast, if not the favour of his comely face, if not his princely cheer and countenance, his valiant active arms, his manly breast, if not his fair and seemly personage, his noble limbs in such proportions cast as would have wrapped a silly woman's thought. If this might not have moved the bloody heart and that most cruel hand, the wretched weapon even to let fall, and kissed him in the face with tears for Ruth, to reave such one by death, should nature yet consent to slay her son. O oh, mother, thou to murder thus thy child, even Jove with justice must with lightning flames from heaven send down some strange revenge on thee. Ah, oh, noble prince, how oft have I beheld thee mounted on thy fierce and trampling steed, shining in armour bright before the tilt, and with thy mistress sleeve tied on thy helm, and charge thy staff to please thy lady's eye, that bowed the headpiece of thy friendly foe. How oft in arms on horse to bend the mace, how oft in arms on foot to break the sword, which never now these eyes may see again. Madam, alas, in vain these plaints are shed, Rather, with me depart and help to assuage the thoughtful griefs that in the aged king must needs by nature grow by death of this his only son, whom he did hold so dear. What white is that which saw that I did see and could refrain to wail with plaint and tears? Not I, alas, that heart is not in me. But let us go, for I am grieved anew to call to mind the wretched father's woe. When greedy lust in royal seat to reign, hath reft all care of gods and eke of men, and cruel heart, wrath, treason and disdain, within the ambitious breast are lodged then. Behold how mischief wide herself displays, and with the brother's hand the brother slays. When blood thus shed, thus stain this heaven's face, crying to Jove for vengeance of the deed, the mighty God even moveth from his place. With wrath to reek, then sends he forth with speed, the dreadful furies, daughters of the night, with serpents girt, carrying the whip of ire, with hair of stinging snakes and shining bright, with flames and blood, and with a brand of fire. These for the revenge of wretched murder done, to make the mother kill her only son. Blood asketh blood, and death must death require. Jove, by his just and everlasting doom, justly hath ever so required it. These times before record, and times to come, shall find it true, and so does present proof, present before our eyes for our behalf. O happy wight that suffers not the snare of murderous mind to tangle him in blood, and happy he that can in time beware 
by others' harms and turn it to his good. But woe to him that, fearing not to offend, doth serve his lust and will not see the end. Did ever age bring forth such tyrants' hearts? The brother hath bereft the brother's life. The mother, she hath dyed her cruel hands in blood of her own son. And now at last the people, low, forgetting trouble and love, contemning quite both law and loyal heart, even they have slain their sovereign lord and queen. For this their traitorous crime, the unpunished rest, even yet they cease not, carried out with rage, and their rebellious roots to threaten still a new bloodshed unto the prince's kin, to slay them all and to uproot the race. Both the queen and queen, so are they moved with Porex's death, wherein they falsely charge the guiltless king without desert at all, and traitorously have murdered him therefore and eke the queen. Oh, shall subjects dare with force to invoke revenge upon their prince's fact? Admit the worst that may, as sure in this, that the, the deed was foul, the queen to slay her son. Shall yet the subject seek to take the sword, arise against his lord and slay his king? Oh, wretched state where those rebellious hearts are not rent out even from their lying breasts and with the body thrown into the fowls as carrion food for terror of the rest there can be no punishment be thought too great for this so grievous crime let speed therefore be used therein for it behoveth so ye all my lords i see consent in one and i as one Consent with ye in all. I hold it more than need with the sharpest law to punish the tumultuous, bloody rage. For nothing more may shake the common state than sufferance of uproars without dis redress. Whereby how some kingdoms of mighty power, after great conquests made and, and flourishing in fame and wealth, have been to ruin brought. I pray to Jove that we may rather wail such hap in them than witness in ourselves. Equally with the Duke, my mind agrees that no cause serves whereby the subject may call to account the doings of his prince, much less in blood by sword to work revenge. No more than may the hand cut off the head in act or speech, no, not in secret thought the subject may rebel against his lord or, or judge of him that sits in Caesar's seat. With grudging mind be damn those he mislikes. The kings forget to govern as they ought, yet subjects must obey as they are bound. But now, my lords, before ye further wade or spend ye speech, what sharp revenge shall fall by justice plague on these rebellious whites, methinks you rather should first search the ways by which in time the rage of this uproar might be repressed and these great tumults ceased. Even yet the life of Britain land doth hang in, in traitor's balance of unequal weight. Think not, my lords, the death of Gorbodok, nor yet Videna's blood will cease their rage. Even our own lives, our wives and children, dear. Our country, dearest of all, in danger stands. Now, to be spoiled now, now made desolate, and by ourselves a conquest to ensue, Forgive one sway unto the people's lusts to rush forth on and stay them not in time. And as the stream that rolleth down the hill, so will the headlong run with raging thoughts from blood to blood, from mischief unto more, to ruin of the realm themselves and all. So giddy are the common people's minds, so glad of change, more wavering than the sea, you see, my lords, what strength these rebels have, what hungry numbers assembled still. 
for though the traitorous fact for which they rose be wrought and done, yet lodge they still in field. So that how far their furies yet will stretch, great cause we have to dread that we may seek by present battle to repress their power. Speed must be used to levy force therefore, for either they forthwith will mischief work or their rebellious roars forthwith will cease. These violent things may have no lasting long. Let us therefore use this for present help persuade, a gentle speech and offer grace with gift of pardon, save unto the chief, and that upon condition that forthwith they yield the captains of their enterprise to bear such guerdon of their traitorous fact as may be both do vengeance to themselves and wholesome terror to posterity. This shall I think, scatter the greatest part that now are holden with desire of home, wearied in field with cold winter's nights, and some no doubt stricken with dread of law. When this is once proclaimed, it shall make the captains to mistrust the multitude whose safety bids them to betray their heads. And so much more because the rascal routs in things of great and perilous attempts are never trusty to the noble race. And while we treat and stand on terms of grace, we that both stay their furies, rage the while and eke gain time, whose only help sufficeth without an war to vanquish rebels' power. In the meantime, make you in readiness such band of horsemen as you may prepare. Horsemen, you know, are not the common's strength, but are the force and store of noble men, whereby the unchosen and unarmed source of skillless rebels, whom none other power but number makes to be of dreadful force, with sudden brunt may quickly be oppressed. And if this gentle mean of proffered grace with stubborn hearts cannot so far avail as to assuage their desperate courages, then do I wish such slaughter to be made as present age and eke posterity may be a dread with horror of revenge that justly shall on these rebels fall. This is my lords, the sum of my advice. Neither this case admits debate at large, and though it did, this speech that hath been said hath well abridged the tale I would have told. Fully with Eubulus do I consent in all that he hath said, and if the same to you, my lord, may seem for best advice, I wish that it should straight be put in your. My lords, then let us presently depart, and follow this that liketh us so well. If ever time to gain a kingdom here were offered man, now it is offered me. The realm is reft both of their king and queen. The offspring of the prince is slain and dead. No issue now remains, the heir unknown. The people are in arms and mutinies. The nobles, they are busied how to cease these great rebellious tumults and uproars. And Britain land now deserted, left alone, amid these broils uncertain where to rest, offers herself unto that noble heart that will or dare pursue to bear her crown. Shall I, that am the Duke of Albany, descended from that line of noble blood which hath so long flourished in worthy fame of valiant hearts, such as in noble breasts of right should rest above the baser sort, refuse to adventure her life to win a crown? Whom shall I find enemies that will withstand my fact herein, if I attempt by arms to seek the same now in these times of broil. These dukes' power can hardly well appease the people that already are in arms. But if perhaps my force be once in field, 
Is not my strength in power above the best of all these lords now left in Britain land? And though they should match me with power of men, yet doubtful is the chance of battles joined if victors of the field we may depart. Ours is the scepter then of Great Britain. If slain amid the plain this body lie, and mine enemies sh yet shall not deny me this, but that I died, giving the noble charge to hazard life for conquest of a crown. Forthwith, therefore, will I in post depart to Albany and raise in armour there all power I can. And here, my secret friends, by secret practice, shall solicit still to seek to win to me the people's heart. Oh, Jove, how are these people's hearts abused? What blind fury thus headlong carries them that through so many books, so many rules of ancient time record what gravest plagues light on these rebels? Aye, and though so often their ears have heard their ancient fathers tell what just reward these traitors still receive, yea, though themselves have seen deep death and blood by strangling cord and slaughter of the sword to such a sign, yet can they not beware, yet cannot stay their lewd, rebellious hands, but suffering to foul treason to disdain their wretched minds, forget their loyal heart, reject all truth and rise against their prince, a rueful case that those whom duty is bond, whom grafted law by nature and faith bound to preserve their country and their king, born to defend their commonwealth and prince, even they should give consent thus to subvert thee, Britain land, and from the womb should spring, oh, native soil, those that will needs destroy and ruin thee, and eke themselves in fine. For lo, when once the duke had offered grace of pardon sweet, the multitude misled by traitorous fraud of their ungracious heads. One sword that saw the dangerous success of stubborn standing in rebellious war and knew the difference of prince's power from headless number of tumultuous roots whom common countries care and private fear taught to repent terror of their age laid hand upon the captains of their band and brought them bound unto the mighty dukes another sort not trusting yet so well the truth of pardon, or mistrusting more their own offense than that they could conceive such hope of pardon for so foul misdeed, or for that they, their captains, could not yield, who, fearing to be yielded, fled before, stole home by silence of the secret night. The third, unhappy and enraged sort of desperate hearts stained in prince's blood from traitorous furor could not be withdrawn. By love, by law, by grace, nay yet by fear, by, by proffered life, nay yet by threatened death, with minds hopeless of life, dreadless of death, careless of country and aweless of God, stood bent as to fight as furies did them move with violent death to close their traitorous life. These all by the power of horsemen were oppressed and with revenging sword slain in the field or with a strangling cord hanged on the trees where yet carrion carcasses do preach the fruits that rebels reap of their uproars. 
and of the murder of their sacred prince. Hello? Where do approach the noble dukes by whom these tumults have been thus appeased? I think the world will now at length beware and fear to put on arms against their prince. If not, those treacherous hearts that dare rebel, let them behold the wide and huge fields with blood and bodies spread with rebels slain, the lofty tress clothed with corpses dead, strangled with the cord to hang their off. A just reward such as all times before have ever lauded to those wretched folks. But what means he that cometh here so fast? My lords, as duty and my truth doth move, and of my country work and care in me, that if the spending of my breath avail to do the service that my heart desires, I would not shun to embrace a present death, so have I now, in that wherein I thought my travail might perform some good effect, ventured my life to bring these tidings here. Fergus. The mighty Duke of Albany is now in arms and lodgeth in the fields with 20,000 men. Hither he bends his speedy march and minds to invade the crown. Daily he gathereth strength and spreads abroad that to this realm no certain heir remains, that Britain land is left without a guide, that he, the scepter, seeks for nothing else but to preserve the people and the land, which now remains a ship without a stern. Lo, this is that which I have here to say. Is this his faith? And shall he falsely thus abuse the vantage of unhappy times? Oh, wretched land, if his outrageous pride, his cruel and untempered willfulness, his deep dissembling shows of false pretense should once attain the crown of Britain land, let us, my lords, with timely force resist the new attempt of this, our common foe, as we would quench the flames of common fire. Though we remain without a certain prince to weld the realm or guide the wandering rule, yet now the common mother of us all, our native land, our country that contains our wives, children, kindred, ourselves and all that ever is or may be dear to man, cries unto us to help ourselves and her. Let us advance our powers to repress this growing foe of all our liberties. Yea, let us to my lords with hasty speed, and ye, O oh gods, send us the welcome death to shed our blood in fields, and leave us not in loathsome life to linger out our lives, to see the huge heaps of these unhaps that now roll down upon the wretched land, where empty place of princely governance, no certain stay, now left of doubtless air. Thus leave this guideless realm an open prey. Thus endless storms and waste of civil war. That ye, my lords, do so agree in one to save your country from the violent reign and wrongfully usurped tyranny of him that threatens conquest of you all, to save your realm in this your and in this realm yourselves from foreign thraldom of so proud a prince, much do I praise. And I beseech the gods with happy honor to requite it you. But, O oh, my lords, since now the heaven's wrath has reft this land, the issue of their prince, since of the body of our late sovereign lord remains no more since the young kings be slain, and of the title of descended crown, uncertainly the diverse minds do think, even of a learned sort, and more uncertainly with pastoral fancy and affection deem, but most uncertainly with climbing pride and hope of wane, rain withdraw to sundry parts the doubtful right and hopeful lust to reign. When once this noble service is achieved for Britain land, the mother of y'all, when once ye have with armed force repressed the proud attempts of this Albanian prince that threatens thraldom to your native land, when ye shall vanquishers return from field and find the princely state an open prey to greedy lust and to usurping power, then, then my lords, if ever kindly care of ancient honor of your ancestors, of present wealth and nobleness of your stocks, yea, if the lives and safety yet to come of your dear wives, your children and yourselves might move your noble hearts with gentle Ruth, then, then have pity 
on the torn estate, then help to solve the near, well near hopeless sore, which ye shall do if ye yourselves withhold the slaying knife from your own mother's throat. Her shall you save, and you and yours in her, if ye shall all with one assent forbear once to lay hands or take unto yourselves the crown by color of pretended right, or by what other means soe'er it be, till first, by common counsel of you all, in Parliament, the regal diadem be set in certain place and governance, in which your Parliament, and in your choice, prefer the right, my lords, without respect of strength or friends or whatsoever cause that may set forward on any other's part. For right will last, and wrong cannot endure. Right mean I, his or hers upon whose name the people rest by mean of na native line, or by the virtue of some former law already made their title to advance. Such one, my lords, let be your chosen king. Such one so born within your native land, such one prefer and in no wise admit the heavy yoke of foreign governance. Let foreign titles yield to public weal. And with that heart wherewith ye now prepare thus to withstand the proud invading foe, with that same heart, my lords, keep out also unnatural thraldom of a stranger's reign. May suffer you against the rule of kings, your motherland to serve a foreign prince. Whoa, here the end of Brutus' royal line. And lo, the entry to the woeful wreck and utter ruin of this noble realm. The royal king and eke his sons are slain. No ruler rests within the regal seat. The heir to whom the setter longs unknown that to each force of foreign princes power whom Vantage of your wretched state by sudden arms to gain so rich a realm. And to the proud and greedy mind at home, who blinded lust to reign, leads to aspire. <laughs> Lo, Britain, realm is left an open prey, <laughs> present spoil by conquest to ensue, who seeth not how many rising minds do feed their thoughts with hope to reach a realm and who will not by force attempt to win so great a gain that hope persuades to have a simple color for shelf or title serve. Who wins the royal crown will want no right, nor such as shall display by long descent a lineal race to prove himself a king. In the meanwhile, these civil arms shall rage. And thus a thousand mischiefs shall unfold, and far and near spread thee, O oh, Britain land, all right and law shall cease. And he that had nothing today, tomorrow, shall enjoy great heaps of gold. And he that flowed in wealth, lo, he shall be reft of life and all. And happiest he that possesseth the least, the wives shall suffer rape. The maids deflowered, children fatherless shall weep and wail. Fire and sword, thy native folk shall perish. One kinsman shall bereave another life. The father shall unwitting slay the son. The son shall slay the sire. Know it not. Women and maids, the cruel soldier's sword shall pierce to death. And silly children, lo, that playing in the streets and fields are found by violent hands shall close their latter days. Whom shall the fierce and bloody soldier reserve to life? Whom shall he spare from death? Even thou, oh, wretched mother, half alive, thou shalt behold thy dear and only child slain with the sword, while he yet sucks thy breast. Lo, guiltless blood shall thus everywhere be shed. Thus shall the wasted soil yield forth no fruit, but dearth and famine shall possess the land. The town shall be consumed and burned with fire. The peopled cities shall wax desolate. And thou, O oh, Britain land, while I'm in renown, while I'm in wealth and fame, shall thus be torn, dismembered thus, and thus be rent in twain thus wasted and defaced, spoiled and destroyed. These be the fruits your civil wars will bring. 
Near to it comes when kings will not consent to grave advice, but follow willful will. This is the end, when in fond prince's hearts flattery prevails, and sage reed hath no place. These are the plagues when murder is the mean to make new heirs unto the royal crown. Thus reek the gods when the mother's wrath, not but the blood of her own child may swage. These mischief springs with rebels will arise to work revenge and judge their prince's fact. This, this ensues when noble men do fail in loyal truth and subjects will be kings. And this doth grow when lo unto the prince whom death or sudden hap of life bereaves no certain heir remains. Such certain heir as not all only is the rightful heir, but to the realm is so made unknown to be. And truth thereby vested in subjects' hearts to owe faith there where right is known to rest. Alas, in parliament, what? Hope can be when is of parliament no hope at all, which though it be assembled by consent, yet is it not likely with consent to end? While well, each one for himself or for his friend against his foe shall travail what he may. Well, now the state left open to the man that shall with greatest force invade the same shall fill ambitious minds with gaping hope. When will they ones with yielding hearts agree or in the while, <laughs> how shall the realm be used? No, no then, parliament should have been holden and certain heirs appointed to the crown to stay their title of established right. And in the people plant obedience. Well, yet the prince did live whose name and power by lawful summons and authority might make a parliament to be of force and might have set the state in quiet state. But now, oh, oh, happy man, whom speedy death deprives of life, nay is enforced to see these hungry mischiefs. And these miseries, these, these civil wars, these murders, and these wrongs of justice. Yet must Jove in fine restore this noble crown unto the lawful heir. For right will always live and rise at length. But wrong can never take deep root to last. Happiness, happiness, oh, yeah. the greatest gift that we possess. Uh, that is sadly all we're actually going to have time for with this session um, to uh, we don't really have any time to uh, talk about it and uh, anything uh, other than the briefest briefest of comments. Um, I think there's some wonderful tour de forces from uh, actors in the room. The internet was not always our friend today. Uh, there was uh, the internet was uh, was definitely. Uh, saying no sometimes uh, uh evil computers but uh, yes uh, uh, some some really lovely a uh, jubilus there just taking a deep breath uh <laughs> I, I haven't had time to actually breathe for 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 a while now uh we've been saying in chat we're all going to be uh, everyone's sort of been getting drinks um uh, w once they died um <laughs> It's quite nice this play. It sort of slowly staggers the deaths in, uh, you know, in a nice even, even. You know, it doesn't wait till the end and then kills everyone. It just waits to the end for the entire civilization to collapse around our ears. Um, <laughs> we've described this in workshops as sort of uh, a, a, a play that just gives us these weird flashes of moments from the decay of a kingdom, rather than uh, follow, following characters uh, too far. Um, any uh, just thoughts on performance and, and how, how it was for you? Very, very briefly. Anyone want to throw uh, dive in there? Uh, no, everyone's so tired. They're so tired. Dan. Just, I wondered if, because this is, a, I mean, it's essentially structured after cynic and tragedy, and it deliberately has the whole five act structure. And I think a lot of it 
as opposed to the play that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, Orestes, um, it really, without, without the dumb shows, I feel like you are really kind of missing something without them, even with just a description of them. So I realized the first version of it, I, I think the first reading of it that was done back in May, I didn't participate, but I think the dumb shows were included in there. I wonder if it is valuable to have them, even though their dumb shows are basically just hitting you over the head with what's going to happen. I, I do think it's an essential part of what this play is about. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this was an exercise in the sense we didn't have time to to do that. It's absolutely core to what we'd be doing in the future, because you're right. It tells you in advance who's going to die. Yeah. Uh, you know, X is about to die now. We have a scene where people come on and are all hopeful going, hey, maybe our sons will make it up. And, uh, and we know as an audience that no, no, bad things, bad things going to happen. X and Y, um, you know, is going on. So no, absolutely, uh, exploring the dumb shows properly as part of performance is sort of the next phase. Because uh, I definitely, I don't, don't want to ignore them because they, they are, they're also a route in for the physicality and the other imagery that could be layered onto this piece as well. There, the, you know, I, I think the imagery is so vital, but it's, it's good for us to get to grips with the technical challenges of, of, of the, the speeches too. Uh, other thoughts very, very briefly, because we don't have much time. Eric. You can kind of tell that it's lawyers that wrote it because <laughs> of the long speeches um, the, and just the sort of, but it's really well written. Just like some of the parts, like um, Helen's part and the whole like um, mother debate, you know, really sort of hateful becoming sort of, uh, what was it, Videna or, mm. and sort of Marcella were really well written considering. Mm. Yes, Viden Videna's uh, a fab part. Um, you know, that, that's, that's one hell of a speech to get your teeth into. I mean, poor old Marcella, she comes on and she says, she's killed Porex. And they all say, let's go and see what's happened. And she says, no, she's killed him. And they don't listen to a word of it. Yeah, it may be Isn't a that just like, Sorry. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that just like men, though? No, <laughs> totally. I, I felt completely sidelined. Um, yes. Uh, other <laughs> thoughts before, <laughs> before we close? <laughs> Uh, okay, we've got a lot more to say about this, and I'm sure we'll say about it in other future sessions. Because say I, I'm not letting go of this play; I'm going to just keep keep drag dragging dragging more bits of it into into the light. Uh, so that's 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 where I'm going. Uh, so all that remains is to uh, thank you for enjoying this uh, nice Christmas Rebels uh, play uh, for for nice cheerful entertainment in, you know, during a festive season. Merry Christmas, everyone, and goodbye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye.